So if it's such a good idea to put a ballon where your coax connects the dipole, why is it such a bad idea to put a ballon right at the feed point for an infant half-wave? Mm, it's magic. Hello, Auggies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kastler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another few episodes of Ask Dave. Our question today comes from Norm, and I'm going to say Chasse. He's AC3GD, so definitely an American. And his question is this. It's about the MFJ915. This right here is an MFJ915. Basically, it's a piece of coax connecting here and here with a gazillion ferrite cores wrapped around the coax. So what will happen is that common mode currents, which are coming on the outside of the coax, will come in here, be dissipated as heat or reflected back, and then you have a nice coax to send to your radio. They say to install this just before the coax comes into your radio, but if you use lightning arresters, you won't need to do that. Let me go through this here. Uh, I have seen you discuss placing the 915 near the center feed on my dipole. What about in-fed long wire antennas? I run an amp and am worried about excess heat in that area. Everything is able to handle the legal limit. You've got a pretty sturdy 49 to 1 ballon if that's the case. A lot of the ballons I see here for 49 to 1 are limited to a few hundred watts. This is an RF isolator and it can handle 1500 watts PEP. Okay, so you can put the legal limit through this thing right here. One of these days I'm going to take it apart just to find out what's inside, or else have it x-rayed. <laughs> Something like that. This was sent to me by MFJ to take a look at, and I did, and I put a video up. And if you look in the uh, text below, you'll find a link to that video on the MFJ 915. But he asked the question a different way. Normally, when you have a dipole, if you feed it directly without a ballon, you run the risk of getting RF on the outside of the coax, which can detune the antenna or, in the worst case, come all the way into your shack and cause radio frequency or RFI interference with your radio. And a lot of people don't like that. I'm one of them. So they say put this in just before it goes into the radio. That way the radio doesn't have to deal with that stuff. Now, thinking just a little bit more about how these things work, the ferrites present a high impedance to the common mode current. So it reflects it back where it came from. And I go out the antenna. So if you use something like this, note that you may have to retune your antenna slightly to account for that. I would like to put the chokes out at the antenna so I don't get that stuff coming in. But both cases assume that the coax comes directly from your antenna to your radio, and that is not best practice. So let me show you a couple things on the whiteboard. Okay, let's suppose you have a dipole. It's hanging between two trees here, okay, and you are center feeding it. Now, if here's the wire and here's the wire, and you put an insulator in the middle like this with some holes in it. And you can buy these. The electric fence insulators is what I use. Or you can use just a little piece of PVC pipe, drill a couple holes, and uh, use that. And then you bring your coax up to here. Okay, and it's got a center line, which you attach over there. And then it's got the, the shield, which you attach over there. This is a very simple and, I might add, workable way of building a dipole. Now, the problem is that this is unbalanced line. This is a piece of LMR 400 coax. And you see here's the center line. And then here's the outer shield. Uh, there's actually two shields in this one. This is tinned copper. Now, the thing about this is that it keeps all the RF inside the coax. But when you hit the antenna like this, and you connect it like this, RF can flow back down the outside of the coax. Okay, we call that common mode current, and it can create a problem. What a lot of people will do 
is instead they will connect it like this. You've got your center insulator with your holes in it and your wires out like that. They'll put right here a one-to-one -one ballon. Ballon. Okay, right here, put their coax into it. And then you've got two wires coming out here and connect it like that. So that gives you unbalanced down here. Balance, unbalanced is when you've got the center conductor. And then this out here is grounded. Okay, so all the work is being done by the center conductor. And then you go through the one-to-one -one ballon, put it up to here, and you're in good shape. Now, there are two ways to make that one-to-one -one ballon. You can take a ferrite core, bring the wire in. Sometimes this is done by wrapping the two wires together. But basically, you've got one wire that's about three turns around. The other is about three turns around. And yes, there's a correct core to use for this. Sometimes these two are wrapped in close proximity. But this is balanced because you're only going to attach this to a balanced antenna. This is unbalanced because this eventually will connect to ground. And yes, if you're feeding an antenna low or something like that, you can put a ground wire in. What some people will do, they'll put their dipole in, okay, they'll have their little ballon here, they'll come straight down to the ground and have a connector and then a little barrel connector that then takes the coax away and this right here exposes the outer shield. So you just put that right into a ground rod. That, that'll do it for sure. Now there's two ways of building this. The first I showed you was the transformer way. The other way is to take like a piece of 1.5 inch plastic pipe. The dimensions are not critical. This works easiest with RG8X. RG58 will work too, but RG8X is better cut. And you wrap that around here, okay, and then come out the bottom down this way. And this, for what's inside the coax, doesn't make any difference. Because the nice thing about a shield is that it shields. It keeps any RF activity outside of this from getting in. But what you are creating is a coil made of the outer part of the core here, and this will present a high impedance, high Z, to this and keep the common mode currents away from it. And that will work really well. A friend of mine, Lou French, does all of his antennas like this. It works very well for him. Now the question gets a little sticky when you get into NFED half waves. An NFED half wave has your toroid with like one, two, three turns here, okay, three turns, and you've got 21 turns here, 21 turns, okay. So the ratio of turns is 21 to 3, which is 7. That's your voltage ratio, and your current is reduced by 7. Now, to get the impedance of this, this if you're using this as a voltage transformer, it's a 7 is the ratio. But if you're using it as an impedance transfer, you have to take into account the characteristic impedance of the wire. So you take 7 squared, which is 49, multiply it by 50. And I think this is about what you come out with right here. And then this, one end of this, feeds your end-fed half wave, and you've got an insulator on the other end. If this will cover 80 meters, this will be on the order of 120 feet long. If you're just doing 40 meters, It'll be on the order of 60 plus feet long, okay? But then that begs the question, where does the other side of this primary go? Well, what they often do in these is they come around and connect it here. And this is the shield side of the coax. Here's your coax coming in here and plugging into this ballon. So that immediately unbalances the thing here. So this is actually unbalanced to unbalanced. So we call this an un-un. Now why do we do this? This needs to, quote, work against something. Now what you work against 
it best is modeled as a capacitor. You push current into it, and then it turns right around and gives the current back. Okay? If you were to put this device here, there would be no place for that current to go because it'd be reflected by this. And your NFED halfway would not work. Now, you can do two things over here. You can connect this directly to a ground rod, okay? And if you're doing an inverted V like this, and the end with the run on is over here, it's not that far down. You could put a ground rod there, okay? They could work against ground. It's got to work against something. It's like trying to push something away from a wall. Here's the wall. Here's you. Okay, and here's the refrigerator that you're pushing. You're pushing this way with your back against the wall. You're working against the wall to push the refrigerator forward, okay? That's exactly what is happening right here. Basically, in your 49 to 1 balance, this is 49 to 1, and this is 50 ohms coming in here, and this has got two terminals, one end off and the other one's down over here. This goes to your antenna, okay? It, the antenna starts there. Then you've got your coax over here. And a lot of people leave this unhooked. This is the part where it's going to work against something, but it's also connected to the shield of the coax here. So you want to bring your coax down, and I would say 30 feet-ish, okay? And this now becomes common mode current on the outside, the braid side of your coax. Now, one thing we haven't discussed so far is the lightning arrestor. This right here is a functioning lightning arrestor. This is an Alpha Delta Communications Model TT 3G50 at 50 ohms. And it's got UHF connectors on it that look like SO239. Okay, in fact, it says SO239 on that one and that one. What you can do with this, I would leave the nut in place. There, there are holders for this that use that nut. Get a hose clamp, bring it around this, and clamp that down to your ground rod. Whenever you're dealing with lightning, we always used crimped or tight connectors. You don't want any solder in there because the surge current through the outside of the coax, through here, and will also be on the inside of the coax, and that will go to ground. Now, since that goes to ground, we put our lightning arrestor here, and it is grounded. And then this goes into the shack, okay? You want this right where the coax goes into the house. Now, Lou has a second story ham shack. So what he does is he runs all his cables outside the wall, all the way down to his ground rod, okay, with his lightning arrestor, and then he takes this out to his antenna, okay? That way, lightning is stopped here. Now, he can pick up a little lightning out of here, but far less than he would have without that. This right here, the case, as you can see, is aluminum block. Well, I think it's a block of stainless steel. Current will flow through that into ground. So, where does your RF current. It's working against something, remember? It's working against the outside of the coax, which ends up being grounded right here. For in-fed antennas, you could ground this, but I've never had to. I've got quite a few feet on my test coax outside that I put on all the test antennas. Right now, it's connected to a ZS6BKW antenna, which I use today for some FT8. So this thing, if you really wanted to, would go here. Or if you really wanted to, it could go here, although the ground there will take care of it, or it can go right where the antenna goes into your rig. Okay? And that will really keep the common mode current out. So that's the distinction I wanted to make for this question here from Norm, is that for an end-fed half-wave wire, you want some coax over here to act as a counterpoise. A counterpoise is something electrical you work against. The most common form of a counterpoise is a radial system. In fact, in my old dictionary, counterpoise is defined as radials. 
And we don't have to actually have them as radials. You can do it this way. Here too. Okay, so there you have it. So on your end pad half wave, I would go ahead and put that uh, 49 to 1 ball in with about 30 feet of coax. If you have extra coax, you can just lay it on the ground. Wrapping or coiling coax does nothing to what's inside the coax, but it very much can affect the common mode currents on the side. That's why another form of this ballon that you can put is to just take about 25 feet of coax and coil it like that. Take some wire wraps, put them around the thing to keep it in shape right there, and that will also act as a choke. A choke, and since the purpose of the choke is to keep the balanced over here and the unbalanced over here, we call it a ballon, even though it just looks like a piece of wrapped up coax. By the way, I don't know if you've ever noticed as you're wandering along some country road, you see the electric wires going up there, and underneath is the cable TV. And you'll note every so often on the cable TV, they put a loop of wire and then they continue. This is coaxial cable that they're using. And what that loop is for is not just to give them extra cable in case they need it, but it is a common mode choke. It gets rid periodically of the voltage that builds up on the outside of the coax. Because if it gets inside, it really messes things up. So there you have it. If you would like to support this channel, you can join up via Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash ke0og, sign up for the $2 or above level, or up from, say, $2 to $5 or something like that, and we will send you a genuine U.S. currency $2 bill for your very own that you can have. We'll do that for the first month as a thank you note. Now, there are countries where it's illegal to ship currency in. When you fill out for Patreon, make sure that you get your call sign in there somewhere. Uh, put it with your last name. Last name Smith and put a call sign KA5BCD. Okay, whatever it is. Get your call sign in there because we can look up your address on QRZ. There you have it. Good to talk to you today. Look forward to talking to you again soon. Until we next meet, 73.